So YouTube hates any video that doesn't start out with sparks, loud noises, or explosions. And um, unfortunately, uh, this one I can't start that way, but I hope you stick around while I explain a couple things to you. Uh, I have been absent for the last five weeks, and the reasons are uh, unfortunate, but my 94-year-old dad, who started our little store, Rody's, um, had a stroke, and uh, he, he had a pretty major stroke. And because of that, I've been left trying to manage the store um, and also help my, along with my sister to manage his, his, his medical care uh, as we try to figure out exactly how far um, dad can progress, how far we can take his physical future. And anyway, as a result of that, it's just this YouTube thing has sort of sunk to the bottom of, of my priority list. And uh, for all my subscribers, those of you who come back on a regular basis, I just kind of hope that uh, hope that you're patient with me as, as my sister and I try to try to work through all of this. And been a busy, been a busy uh, four or five weeks. So, anyway, thanks for thanks for understanding and thanks for sticking around. So I do have a video today, and I do have a project that's that's in the shop. Uh, this is a uh, rear buttstock for a Remington Model 1100. Uh, this goes for a customer. A customer brought this in. Actually, he's a he's a really good customer. Uh, been coming to the shop for years and years and, and has gotten to be really good friends with my dad and all the rest of the crew at the shop. Uh, his, Earl is a, is a small, compact man and the standard length of pull on most shotguns is really too long for Earl and he has, he has a hard time reaching the trigger when he's mounting, mounting this shotgun. So he asked me if I'd install a, a new pad. Now Earl uh, shortened this gun stock and my, my job today is to install this new, new pad. Uh, and one of the problems that we're gonna run into very quickly is that he literally took off an inch from, from the length of the stock, which is fine for his length of pull. But that gets so far down into the narrow section of this gun stock because of the taper that getting this thing fit up well is going to, it, it, we'll get it done, but it's going to be, going to be a little bit of a, of a, of a job to, to do because, uh, again, that, that dimension from top to bottom has become so small. Earl cut this off and he did a pretty nice job. But there's still a little bit of uh, rock in this. Um, his saw didn't get this as flat as it needed to be. So uh, we're going to do that first. We're going to we're going to try to flatten this this um, this cutoff so that the pad, which is very flat, fits as, as well as well and as tight as it needs to. All right. So let's get started. Now, when cutting off a gun stock, especially one that's existing and one that's already been pre-finished, uh, one of the things that we have to be very careful of is that when you're cutting that you don't chip around these edges. And uh, the chips, the finish is so hard, especially on these older guns, that uh, when you chip it, it then it becomes more difficult to blend it in to, to do the repair. Uh, the other thing is, is that it needs to be as flat as can be. And as I said, Earl did a pretty good job with this, but unfortunately on the very end, he did, he did roll it over or dub it off. And that, that's about an eighth of an inch drop off at, at the very end. So I'm going to have to go in and fix all that before I can put the pad on so that this, uh, this now becomes the, the new um, final cutoff length. So I've got to go in and do that. My thought at first was to go back onto the saw or to even use a, my platen sander and try to sand that back. But 
looking at this, that's going to be a lot of material to, to pull off. So what I think I'm going to do is put this in the mill and get this leveled up as best as I can. And then using the cutter on the mill, sort of flatten this off and that way I can actually come around using using the rotation of the cutter to pull into the finish and then um, get rid of the chips that that were left behind and then get as flat a surface as I can. So let's set up the mill. <clears throat> now this is a method I've used quite effectively over the years. Uh, I have this uh, jig that I made uh, out of melamite or melamine or whatever it's called and I made the jig so that it is so that it's square so I've got these these two 90 degrees and I actually cut it away or inlet this in and I have this backing backing uh, support that I put in then I drilled a couple holes so that I can get it into the key slots on my mill and knowing that this is perpendicular to the table, once I've got the, the stock set up so that it is as perpendicular to, to the table as I can get it, then I can use the cutter on the mill to, to effectively cut a nice flat surface. Um, it just helps me sort of guarantee that, that I'm, not, I'm not going to be fighting with the saw blade, uh, which which is again, it's a fine way to do it. A lot of people will use a crosscut saw, but um, I just, like I said, I've done this many times and, it, and it's pretty effective and it's the method that I prefer. So let's go ahead and get this done. Just need to keep it you know, fairly rigid and fairly solid. Uh, all right, so the next thing I gotta do is I don't know if you can see the relationship to the cutter to the top of this, but the table, the cross table, this cross slide table is really too high. So we're going to lower that down. We're going to have to go pretty low on the setting to get this thing down where it needs to be. And we'll do the same thing and get, get the cross slide somewhere centered to this upright. Trouble with a manual machine, lots of cranking. I have sort of a old school affinity for hand cranking these machines. A lot of my CNC friends will kind of laugh at me for it, but uh, there's a there's a sense of connection to the machine. It's sort of like playing the guitar. If you play guitar, you understand that there's a there's a relationship between you know, both you and, and the instrument. Pretty nice connection. I know it's probably all, you all thinking it's all kind of bullshit maybe, but it, it means something to me. So the next thing that has to happen is we need to take the stock and get it mounted so that it's both flat this way and flat this way. So we'll uh, just get some wood clamps and hold it because the amount of material that I'm going to take off isn't going to put a lot of stress or pressure on the, on the wood, so we don't need a lot of clamping pressure. <clears throat> so getting this thing mounted, uh, again, as I said, was not a huge deal, but one thing I need to be careful of is that I have this thing as level as I can in this direction. So the dimension on the lower section where it mounts to the receiver is 1 inch 360. The dimension up here is 1 inch 630. So there's about um, 300 thousandths difference end to end. So I'm going to have to shim this out. like that pretty well and then the next thing I need to do is get it level in this way and I'll use Earl's Earl's cut on that one so
and we'll just keep tapping it until the bubble level comes up level which we have it's pretty good right there squeeze that up sort of sighting down along the center line of this stock and this is a little bit of guess by gosh um, because of the way it is but I think we got it pretty close so next thing we're gonna do again I got this low spot over here which is the real the biggest low spot that I have to get off uh, so I'm going to turn around and cut this probably only a few thousands at a time because I want to put as I said a lot of stress stresses on the wood and I'm going to use you know sort of a conventional mill where the cutter is turning into the wood so I'm literally pulling the wood into itself with a cutter and I'll come around the outside edge doing the same thing so that I'm pulling the finish and the wood into itself that'll help prevent as much of the chipping as I can and then once I got into the center it's not such a big deal all right That's so nice. Now in this case I'm using Packmeyer, uh, Packmeyer decelerator. Now I like Packmeyer pads. I know there's a lot of other brands out there. I'm familiar with Packmeyer. Uh, I've used them many times and in fact when I worked for Ruger some of the pads that we used back in the day were made by Packmire. Uh, they may still be, I'm not entirely sure of that anyway. Now one of the things about these pads and what makes them really pretty nice pads is embedded in the plastic is a steel insert and that steel insert uh, helps keep this pad flat so it doesn't allow it to sort of bend or deflect over time. So it keeps it flat. And then when you screw it down uh, through, the, through that um, steel insert, uh, it, it keeps it flat against the wood, which is, which is always the, the, um, <laughs> the, the hope or the goal. But one of the problems is, is that insert has dimension. It has a place that it lives inside that plastic. So we have to be very careful that we don't position the pad in such a way that when we uh, sand it down that we sand down into that insert because we don't want to see, see, see that insert and if that happens then I'm going to be stuck buying another pad. So Packmire also provides these, these templates and make three, three size pads, small, medium, and large. In this case as I mentioned in the earlier part of the video, we're down so tiny into the, this section of the stock that I had to buy a small pad. Uh, so I need to be very careful that, that when I install this, drill the holes and install it, that I don't uh, position it in a place where I begin to hand form the pad down to the stock that I don't get down into that washer. So what I need to do is now position the stock on that template and then figure out how is it that I um, position it so that I never get down to that, that, steel, that steel insert. Can. What I'll do is I'll take a red Sharpie and then mark, mark around the edge of the stock as it's cut. Why red? Because it shows up. Now this is just a rough outline because 
the actual um, the actual process of fitting it, uh, there is room to spare. There's space to spare. So as long as I've got enough of an extra amount of uh, material beyond that spacer, I'll be fine. All right. Now that I've got the line drawn, I'm going to use a standard set of paper shears and cut around that line because when I'm finished cutting it, I'm going to use that placement on the end of the stock in order to figure out where my hole has to go, my screw hole has to go, so um, that the screw holes themselves are the positioning of the pad on the wood. And again, I'm not afraid to leave a little bit of extra material. Things I didn't mention it, these uh, blueprints or templates that Packmeyer pro provides are one to one, so you're not left guessing where everything is located. You can actually just use the template or the blueprint to get a pretty accurate location for everything that you need to do. All right, so there we go. So I need to, to position the template onto the stock so that I know where to drill the holes and uh, clamping the stock in my, my, standard jaw, my standard vise. I have this felt lining or felt pad that, that I've been using for years uh, so that I put it between the jaws of the vise and again I don't want to scratch the finish. So has enough give that it sort of self forms itself around the stock. And then we're going to put this template on, which is already uh, the shape of the stock. So I'll take some small pieces of painter's tape, because the nice thing about the painter's tape is, first off, it's easily removed. And then the other part is that it's less likely to pull or strip the finish. Again, I'm trying to balance this template to what I drew. So I have this spring-loaded center punch uh, that I'll use. I'll center it to the hole in the template and uh, just pop it in and that spring-loaded punch will leave a dimple below the paper and it's that dimple that I'll use to orient the drill and drill motor so that I'm drilling the hole for the for the screws for the pad. I need to drill the holes so that the screws can get installed in order to secure the pad and you need to choose the right size drill. Now this is hardwood, but Walnut actually drills and screws pretty easily. But that said, you don't want your drill to be significantly smaller than the root size of the screw itself. And the root is that dimension that uh, is the solid part of the screw. So we're going to use a, a 110 drill, which is roughly the, the root of the, of the screw. Again, if you use a drill that's too small, uh, it's not the threads that are biting into the, into the wood, but you're actually forcing the body of the screw to, to put pressure on the inside of that hole, which, which potentially for some woods could actually split the wood so we don't want to do that. The other problem that we're dealing with is that we're down into such a small section of that height that we don't want that screw to p 
pierce or come out the bottom of the stock or that tapered part of the stock. And in this instance, or in this case, there's plenty of thickness, so I'm not going to really worry about it. I may angle the, the screw hole slightly uh, in the same direction as the bevel on the bottom, but there's not going to have to go that much because, frankly, I'm not going to have to go all that deep with the hole for the screw. I don't need the template on here anymore. It's done its job. I have some really nice uh, dimples that I can use. And again, I don't need to go very deep because at the end I would like to have the, um, the screw bite into the wood a little bit here. So we'll go in about 5 eighths of an inch. I think that should be enough. I'm going to put some tape to act as a end stop for this. Yeah, I mean, that's not going to come out. Now, I always pre-install the screws before putting the pad on because I don't want to be fighting that while I'm trying to center that pad where it needs to be. Other hint, uh, you need to lubricate the screw. I always use soap because um, soap is slippery. I mean, you know how slippery the soap can be in the bathtub. Well, it's a sort of the same, same thing here. So we lubricate it with, with soap. Your brand, your choice. And again, all I'm doing is pre-threading the hole. Because inevitably, every time you use a screw, especially Phillips heads, you're always dinging up or peening over the, the slots. I don't use the same screw to pre-thread. I use one screw each. Now, before I install the pad, when they mold the rubber, they mold the rubber right over the holes themselves, and I have to cut a small slot in order for the screw to go down through that, and I don't want it to, to tear. So I have a little um, hardened steel rod that is roughly the size of the, um, the hole, and I'm gonna place the pad over that rod and as I do that, it sort of raises a dimple here. And then using a fine X-Acto knife, I do that until that pad comes down over the rod. When you pull it off, it literally seals the hole, which is exactly what you want. It's one of the things I like about these Packmeyers is because when you're done with the job, you actually don't see the, the hole that the screw goes into. All right. So with that done, I'm going to install the pad. But doing that, I'm going to do one more precaution. And odd as it may seem, trust me on this one, I'm going to put a little bit of axle grease around that screwdriver or the shank of the screwdriver because um, experience has shown me that the friction between the screwdriver and the rubber on the pad can tear that rubber and I'm really not interested in that happening. So we'll put the screw um, screw into the pad, get that started on that hole. Now the screw still has the soap on it.
Now that hole in that steel spacer is large enough so that once I've got the screws in place, I can then tap that pad left or right depending on what I what direction I need to go in order to center that to to the stock itself. And then once I've got it centered, I can then tighten or torque up that screw so that it doesn't move. Now, the pad at this point is is significantly oversize the, the stock itself, so I have to start sanding away any of that excess material. So what I have is a white china marker that using some sandpaper, I've put a point onto that china marker, and then what I'll do is using that china marker, I'll then come around, trace the stock, and it'll leave a white mark all around the pad. And the nice thing about it is the width of the line is wide enough so that I can, using my platen sander or using my disc sander, I can sand down to the outer part of that white line knowing that when I start to do the final uh, fit that uh, I'll have enough material left over in order to do that. Now the other thing I have to do is I have to cut away what is an excessive amount of material in this, uh, this end of the pad. Obviously I don't want to uh, cut below it, so just tracing the same angle as the, the stock itself I'll draw a white line, and that white line, again, will follow that's that same angle. And then coming over the top, I'll sort of trace that. So now I can pull this pad off, go over to the bandsaw, cut off this excess amount here, and then go over to the, the platen sander or the disc sander and begin to hand shape this to those white lines. I'm going to wrap the wood with this blue painter's tape and I'm going to put a couple layers around it. Now the painter's tape isn't necessarily going to do a lot to protect the wood, though it will to some extent, but I actually use it as a marker to tell me that I'm getting close. So when I hit that first layer with the sanding disc, it's telling me, whoa oh boy, you got to sort of back off and be ready for for the fact that you've gotten really close and you don't want to be hitting the wood you don't want to be scratching the finish because uh, you don't want to be repairing the finish so again I use those two layers I'm just going to use an exacto knife to cut this back to the to the edge of the of the, of the wood itself all right, once I've got that trimmed back, I'm going to put the, the pad back on because I'm going to actually sand back to the pad. Oops, upside down. I'm going to actually sand the pad right back to that tape. And the nice thing about it is gun stock makes a good handle for doing the work. <clears throat> now this is when you want to be making sure that you sort of balance the amount of wood on either side. I mentioned earlier that you can adjust it a little bit because the holes are slightly, slightly larger than the screw itself. The way you're taking off roughly the same amount for each for each side of the stock. So when it 
it's done, the rubber looks symmetrical and not all out of whack or out of balance. All right. <clears throat> Next thing we have to do is go over to the bandsaw and cut this excess amount of uh, pad back so that we can go and finish finish the uh, grinding to the stock itself. <laughs> Now, I almost always take the coward's way out on this, and using the, the sanding disc, I get it as close as I can. Uh, when you get really close and you've got this thing hooked to the wood, uh, the, the possibility of going too far or slipping gets really, really pretty, pretty great. Um, so I almost always finish it with some kind of a bastard file. <laughs> Um, a little bit more time consuming perhaps, but these files take material off in, in, a, in a real hurry. Especially if they're fairly aggressive and sharp. And I also feel that I get a little more control of the final shape this way as well. Also helps me watch my um, proximity or how close I am to that blue tape. Okay, so I'm going to do this all the way around the pad. You don't need to watch all of this and I'll bring you back when I'm closer to being done. I've got it down to the blue tape using the platen sander and my bastard files and my fit's actually really pretty good. What I need to do now is taking some uh, fairly aggressive sandpaper. This is a hundred grit sandpaper and I'm going to start um, being being careful to to stay off the blue tape and only on the pad. I'm going to use the sandpaper to soften or blend those file marks and uh, make them as smooth and contoured to the wood as I can. Using this 100 grit paper, uh, this, is, this allows me to get this shape you know, more refined. And when I'm done with this, then I'll take the tape off and then using a finer grid of paper, get it uh, closer to the final dimension of the, of the wood itself. This probably all seems like a lot of steps. And there are jigs or fixtures that you can use to sand these and all that's good. But because I kind of bill myself as handcrafted, again, I like the idea of being able to have some tighter control over the process as I do this. It doesn't take that long, just a little patience. Once again, I'll bring you back when I'm pulling that blue tape and I'm closer to the final finish. I just finished sanding the hard plastic base of the pad with 180 grit to give it more of a finished uh, look to it. And at this point, I'm down to the two layers of tape. 
So I'm going to pull off the tape and see how close I am to the wood. Uh, if I've got three or four thousandths of hard plastic uh, proud of the wood, I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to try and get any closer to that wood or that finish than, than is necessary. So let's give this a try. All right, I'm pretty pleased with this. This looks, the amount of material that's over that wood is so small that I'm going to leave it. I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm happier not risking scratching that finish. So the last thing I need to do is to remove the pad and apply some finish to the exposed end grain after we cut it. Uh, that'll help prevent or minimize the amount of uh, moisture that can infiltrate the end grain of the wood um, and keep that from so, sort of minimizing the shrinking and swelling of that of the wood uh, through it goes through the different seasons. <clears throat> Remember we needed to add a little bit of axle grease to the pad and to the and to the screwdriver because we don't want to mar up that rubber. We also need to remove the residue of the white china marker that I used earlier to, to mark the perimeter of the stock on the pad. So we want to get that all cleaned up and I'm using denatured alcohol. You could use almost anything, mineral spirits would work as well. The reason I'm using the denatured alcohol is it flashes off pretty quickly so that I can add my finish. So I don't have to wait for the mineral spirits to, to flash off because that generally takes a little bit longer. No mystery finish here. This is just tongue oil that I've cut about 50% with uh, mineral spirits. Uh, the reason I've cut it is it just helps flow better and then it'll go on to the, it'll absorb into that end grain a little bit faster. That, that's, that's it. want to make sure that I get all of it off the finish. Uh, we don't want the, the uh, tongue oil clouding up the, the original finish. All right, we'll let that dry for 15, 20 minutes or kind of harden up. And then we'll put the pad on and be done with it. We've given this a few minutes to dry. And we'll put this pad back on. And the last thing that we need to do at the end is balance the reveal of the plastic over the wood <clears throat> so that we've got this back where it was, or positioned back where it was uh, when, we did, when we did the sanding or did the final finishing. Now I've left this pad over the wood probably about two or three thousandths and my experience, this is, early, this is early summer and the humidity has really just started. The wood, depending on where the gun gets stored, the wood will absorb moisture throughout the summer here in New England. So the wood will actually swell, it'll, get, it'll grow, it'll get bigger. And my theory is that that the wood will actually grow to the pad. Again, I've only left about two thousandths plastic over the wood. And this is not, this is typical of, of, of New England, as opposed to some of the dry states like Arizona where it's, it's, there's no humidity in the air all year long. We have to balance for that here in New England. This time I am going to use a little bit of mineral spirits mineral spirits will flash off a little bit slower and it's less likely to, to leave a haze when it's done. This came out really nice. I think the customer will like this. 
All right, let's give you some close-ups and then we'll close this video out. All right, we're all done. It's headed out to the customer. Pretty sure he'll be pleased with this. So like all the YouTubers say, like, tag, share, follow, subscribe, ring the bell so you get notified the next time I post a video. All that's important. We want to grow this channel. We want to keep providing content to you folks. And I know that YouTube has its own ways of working and it's mysterious. So I'd like you guys to continue to see this stuff. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.